At the Mountains of Madness by H.P. Lovecraft Read by Richard Coyle Part 1 The Discovery I am forced into speech because men of science have refused to follow my advice without knowing why. It is altogether against my will that I tell my reasons for opposing this contemplated invasion of the Antarctic with its vast fossil hunt and its wholesale boring and melting of the ancient ice caps. And I am the more reluctant because my warning may be in vain. In the end, I must rely on the judgment and standing of the few scientific leaders who have, on the one hand, sufficient independence of thought to weigh my data on its own hideously convincing merits, or in the light of certain primordial and highly baffling myth cycles, and on the other hand, sufficient influence to deter the exploring world in general from any rash and overambitious program in the region of those mountains of madness. It is an unfortunate fact that relatively obscure men like myself and my associates, connected only with a small university, have little chance of making an impression where matters of a wildly bizarre or highly controversial nature are concerned. As a geologist, my object in leading the Miskatonic University expedition was wholly that of securing deep-level specimens of rock and soil from various parts of the Antarctic continent aided by the remarkable drill devised by Professor Frank H. Parbody of our engineering department. I had no wish to be a pioneer in any other field than this, but I did hope that the use of this new mechanical appliance at different points along previously explored paths would bring to light materials of a sort hitherto unreached by the ordinary methods of collection. We plan to cover as great an area as one Antarctic season, or longer if absolutely necessary, would permit, operating mostly in the mountain ranges and on the plateau south of Ross Sea, regions explored in varying degree by Shackleton, Amundsen, Scott and Bird. The public knows of the Miskatonic expedition through our frequent wireless reports to the Arkham Advertiser and Associated Press, and through the later articles of Parbody and myself. We consisted of four men from the university, Parbody, Lake of the biology department, Atwood of the physics department, also a meteorologist, and myself, representing geology and having nominal command, besides 16 assistants, seven graduate students from Miskatonic, and nine skilled mechanics. Of these 16, 12 were qualified aeroplane pilots, all but two of whom were competent wireless operators. As the newspapers told, we sailed from Boston Harbor on September the 2nd, 1930, taking a leisurely course down the coast and through the Panama Canal, and stopping at Samoa and Hobart, Tasmania, at which latter place we took on final supplies. None of our exploring party had ever been in the polar regions before, hence we all relied greatly on our ship captains. J.B. Douglas, commanding the brig Arkham, and serving as commander of the Sea Party, and George Thorfinson commanding the bark Miskatonic, both veteran whalers in Antarctic waters. As we left the inhabited world behind, the sun sank lower and lower in the north, and stayed longer and longer above the horizon each day. The falling temperature bothered me considerably after our long voyage through the tropics, but I tried to brace up for the worst rigors to come. On many occasions, the curious atmospheric effects enchanted me vastly, these including a strikingly vivid mirage, the first I had ever seen, in which distant bergs became the battlements of unimaginable cosmic castles. On the 7th of November, we passed Franklin Island, and the next day descried the cones of Mounts Erebus 
and terror on Ross Island ahead, with the long line of the Parry Mountains beyond. There now stretched off to the east the low, white line of the Great Ice Barrier, rising perpendicularly to a height of 200 feet like the rocky cliffs of Quebec, and marking the end of southward navigation. In the afternoon, we entered McMurdo Sound and stood off the coast in the lee of smoking Mount Erebus. The Soriac Peak towered up some 12,700 feet against the eastern sky, like a Japanese print of the sacred Fujiyama, while beyond it rose the white, ghost-like height of Mount Terror, 10,900 feet in altitude, and now extinct as a volcano. Puffs of smoke from Erebus came intermittently, and one of the graduate assistants, a brilliant young fellow named Danforth, pointed out what looked like lava on the snowy slope. We landed all our drilling apparatus, dogs, sledges, tents, provisions, gasoline tanks, experimental ice-melting outfit, cameras, both ordinary and aerial, aeroplane parts and other accessories, including three small portable wireless outfits, besides those in the planes, capable of communicating with the Arkham's large outfit from any part of the Antarctic continent that we would be likely to visit. The ship's equipment, communicating with the outside world, was to convey press reports to the Arkham Advertiser's powerful wireless station on Kingsport Head, Massachusetts. I need not repeat what the newspapers have already published about our early work, of our ascent of Mount Erebus, our successful mineral borings at several points on Ross Island, and the singular speed with which Parbody's apparatus accomplished them, even through solid rock layers. Our provisional test of the small ice-melting equipment, our perilous ascent of the Great Barrier with sledges and supplies, and our final assembling of five huge aeroplanes at the camp atop the barrier. Only four of our planes were needed to carry the actual exploring material, the fifth being left with a pilot and two men from the ships at the storage cache to form a means of reaching us from the Arkham in case all our exploring planes were lost. Wireless reports have spoken of the breathtaking four-hour non-stop flight of our squadron on November the 21st over the lofty shelf ice with vast peaks rising on the west and the unfathomed silences echoing to the sound of our engines. Wind troubled us only moderately and our radio compasses helped us through the one opaque fog we encountered. When the vast rise loomed ahead between latitudes 83 degrees and 84 degrees, we knew we had reached the Beardmore Glacier, the largest valley glacier in the world, and that the frozen sea was now giving place to a frowning and mountainous coastline. At last, we were truly entering the white, eon-dead world of the ultimate south. The outside world was told also of Professor Lake's strange and dogged insistence on a westward, or rather northwestward, prospecting trip. Popular imagination, I judge, responded actively to our wireless bulletins of Lake's start into regions never trodden by human foot or penetrated by human imagination. Though we did not mention his wild hopes of revolutionizing the entire sciences of biology and geology. The start was made January 22nd at 4 a.m. And the first wireless message we received from Lake came only two hours later. 10.05 p.m. on the wing. After snowstorm have spied mountain range ahead higher than any hitherto seen, may equal Himalayas, allowing for height of plateau. Probable latitude, 76 degrees 15 minutes, longitude, 113 degrees 10 minutes east. Reach as far as can see to right and left, suspicion of two smoking cones, all peaks black and bare of snow, gale blowing off them impedes navigation. After that, Parbody, the men and I, hung breathlessly over the receiver. Thought of this 
titanic mountain rampart inflamed our deepest sense of adventure, and we rejoiced that our expedition, if not ourselves personally, had been its discoverers. In half an hour, Lake called us again. Molten's plane forced down on plateau and foothills, but nobody hurt and perhaps can repair. Shall transfer essentials to other three for return or further moves if necessary. But no more heavy plane travel needed just now. Mountains surpass anything in imagination. Am going up scouting in Carol's plane with all weight out. You can't imagine anything like this. Highest peaks must go over 35,000 feet. Everest out of the running. Atwood to work out height with the Autolite while Carol and I go up. Probably wrong about cones, for formations look stratified. Possibly Precambrian slate with other strata mixed in. Queer skyline effects. Regular sections of cubes clinging to highest peaks. Whole thing marvelous in red gold light of low sun. Like land of mystery in a dream or gateway to forbidden world of untrodden wonder. Though it was technically sleeping time, not one of us listeners thought for a moment of retiring. Then, at 11 p.m., came another call from Lake. Up with Carol over highest foothills. I'm up 21,500 myself in devilish, gnawing cold. Wind whistles and pipes through passes and in and out of caves, but no flying danger so far. Obviously, Lake's boring operations, as well as his aeroplane activities, would require a great deal for the new base, which he planned to establish at the foot of the mountains. And it was possible that the eastward flight might not be made, after all, this season. In connection with this business, I called Captain Douglas and asked him to get as much as possible out of the ships and up the barrier with the single dog team we had left there. A direct route across the unknown region between Lake and McMurdo Sound was what we really ought to establish. Lake called me later to say that he had decided to let the camp stay where Moulton's plane had been forced down and where repairs had already progressed somewhat. In the morning, I had a three-cornered wireless talk with Lake and Captain Douglas at their widely separated bases. It was agreed that one of Lake's planes would come to my base for Parbody, the five men, and myself, as well as for all the fuel it could carry. After about 4 p.m., Lake began sending in the most extraordinary and excited messages. His working day had started unpropitiously, since an aeroplane survey of the nearly exposed rock surfaces showed an entire absence of those Archean and primordial strata for which he was looking, and which formed so great a part of the colossal peaks that loomed up at a tantalizing distance from the camp. It was about three hours afterward, following the first really heavy blast of the operation, that the shouting of the drill crew was heard, and that young Gedney, the acting foreman, rushed into the camp with the startling news. They had struck a cave. Early in the boring, the sandstone had given place to a vein of Comanchean limestone full of minute fossil cephalopods, corals, echini, and spirifera, and with occasional suggestions of silicious sponges and marine vertebrate bones, the latter probably of teleosts, sharks, and ganoids. This in itself was important enough, as affording the first vertebrate fossils the expedition had yet secured. But when, shortly afterward, the drill head dropped through the stratum into apparent vacancy, a wholly new and doubly intense wave of excitement spread among the excavators. A good-sized blast had laid open the subterrene secret, and now, through a jagged aperture perhaps five feet across and three feet thick, 
There yawned before the avid searchers a section of shallow limestone hollowing worn more than 50 million years ago by the trickling groundwaters of a bygone tropic world. When Lake had satisfied the first keen edge of his curiosity, he scribbled a message in his notebook and had young Moulton run back to the camp to dispatch it by wireless. This was my first word of the discovery. Lake was not content to let his first message stand, but had another bulletin written and dispatched across the snow to the camp before Moulton could get back. Those who follow the newspapers will remember the excitement created among men of science by that afternoon's reports, reports which have finally led, after all these years, to the organization of the proposed Starkweather Moor expedition, which I am so anxious to dissuade from its purposes. Fowler makes discovery of highest importance in sandstone and limestone fragments from blasts. Several distinct triangular striated prints, like those in Archean Slate, proving that source survived from over 600 million years ago to Comanchean times without more than moderate morphological changes and decrease in average size. Comanchean prints, apparently more primitive or decadent, if anything, than older ones, emphasize the importance of discovery and press will mean to biology what Einstein has meant to mathematics and physics. Joins up with my previous work and amplifies conclusions. And then later... Examining certain skeletal fragments of large land and marine saurians and primitive mammals. Find singular local wounds or injuries to bony structure not attributable to any known predatory or carnivorous animal of any period, of two sorts, straight, penetrant bores, and apparently hacking incisions. One or two cases of cleanly severed bones. And still later. Have found peculiar soapstone fragment about six inches across and an inch and a half thick, wholly unlike any visible local formation. Greenish, but no evidence is to place its period. Has curious smoothness and regularity. Shaped like five-pointed star with tips broken off and signs of other cleavage at inward angles and in center of surface. Small, Smooth depression in center of unbroken surface. Carol, uh, with magnifier, thinks he can make out additional markings of geologic significance. Groups of tiny dots in regular patterns. Dogs growing uneasy as we work and seem to hate this soapstone. Must see if it has any peculiar odor. We'll report again when Mills gets back with light and we start on underground area. 10.15 p.m. Incredible. No, transcendent discovery. Arendorf and Watkins, working underground at 9.45 with light, found eight complete and six incomplete specimens of hitherto unknown life forms. They are the Archean things that left the prints in the rocks we found earlier. Six feet end to end. Three and five tenths feet central diameter, tapering to one foot at each end. Like a barrel with five bulging ridges in place of staves. Dark gray, flexible, and infinitely tough hide miraculously preserved. Seven foot membranous wings of same color found folded, spread out of furrows between ridges. Wing framework tubular or glandular of lighter gray with orifices at wingtips. Spread wings have serrated edge. Around equator, one at central apex of each of the five vertical stave-like ridges are five systems of light gray flexible arms or tentacles found tightly folded to torso but expansible to maximum length of over three feet. 
single stalks three inches diameter branch after six inches into five substalks, each of which branches after eight inches into small tapering tentacles or tendrils, giving each stalk a total of 25 tentacles. At top of torso, blunt, bulbous neck of lighter gray with gill-like suggestions holds yellowish, five-pointed, starfish-shaped apparent head covered with three-inch wiry cilia of various prismatic colors. Five slightly longer reddish tubes start from inner angles of starfish-shaped head and end in sac-like swellings of same color, which, upon pressure, open to bell-shaped orifices two inches maximum diameter and lined with sharp, white, tooth-like projections probably mouths. All these tubes, cilia, and points of starfish head found folded tightly down, the tubes and points clinging to bulbous neck and torso. And his report continued. Tough, muscular arms, four feet long and tapering from seven inches diameter at base to about two and five tenths at point. To each point, is attached small end of a greenish, five-veined, membranous triangle eight inches long and six wide at farther end. This is the paddle, fin, or pseudo-foot, which has made prints in rocks from a thousand million to fifty or sixty million years old. We were wrapped with attention at what we were hearing. Complete specimens have such uncanny resemblance to certain creatures of primal myth that suggestion of ancient existence outside Antarctic becomes inevitable. Job now to get 14 huge specimens to camp without dogs, which bark furiously and can't be trusted. Must be the distinctive smell that's disturbing them. With nine men, three left to guard the dogs, we ought to manage the three sledges fairly well, though wind is bad. I've got to dissect one of these things before we take any rest. I wish I had a real laboratory here. The sensations of Parbody and myself at receipt of this report were almost beyond a description. Nor were our companions much behind us in enthusiasm. Within an hour and a half, interest again rose. Lake, sending more messages, told of the completely successful transportation of the 14 great specimens to the camp. The specimens were laid out on the hard snow near the camp, save for one on which Lake was making crude attempts at dissection. Results, quickly reported over the wireless, were baffling and provocative indeed. Nothing like delicacy or accuracy was possible with instruments hardly able to cut the anomalous tissue. But the little that was achieved left us all awed and bewildered. Existing biology would have to be wholly revised, for this thing was no product of any cell growth science knows about. It had digestion and circulation and eliminated waste matter through the reddish tubes of its starfish-shaped base. Cursorily, one would say that its respiration apparatus handled oxygen rather than carbon dioxide, and there were odd evidences of air storage chambers and methods of shifting respiration from the external orifice to at least two other fully developed breathing systems, gills and pores. Clearly, it was amphibian, and probably adapted to long, airless hibernation periods as well. Vocal organs seemed present in connection with the main respiratory system, but they presented anomalies beyond immediate solution. Articulate speech, in the sense of syllable utterance, seemed barely conceivable, but musical, piping notes covering a wide range were highly probable. The muscular system was almost prematurely developed. The nervous system was so complex and highly developed as to leave Lake aghast. Its five-lobed brain was surprisingly advanced, and there were signs of a sensory equipment served in part through the wiry cilia of the head, involving factors alien to any other terrestrial organism. 
It was partly vegetable, but had three-fourths of the essentials of animal structure. That it was marine in origin, its symmetrical contour and certain other attributes clearly indicated. Yet, one could not be exact as to the limits of its later adaptations. The wings, after all, held a persistent suggestion of the aerial. How it could have undergone its tremendously complex evolution on a newborn Earth in time to leave prints in Archean rocks was so far beyond conception as to make Lake whimsically recall the primal myths about great old ones who filtered down from the stars and concocted Earth life as a joke or mistake. It was after 4 a.m. when Lake at last prepared to sign off and advised us all to share the rest period his outfit would take. I gave Lake a warm word of congratulations, owning up that he was right about the western trip, and we all agreed to get in touch by wireless at 10 in the morning. At that point, Lake would send a plane for the party at my base. Just before retiring... I dispatched a final message to the Arkham with instructions about toning down the day's news for the outside world, since the full details seemed radical enough to rouse a wave of incredulity until further substantiated. None of us, I imagine, slept very heavily or continuously that morning. Both the excitement of Lake's discovery and the mounting fury of the wind were against such a thing. So savage was the blast, even where we were, that we could not help wondering how much worse it was at Lake's camp, directly under the vast, unknown peaks that bred and delivered it. McTie was awake at ten o'clock and tried to get Lake on the wireless as agreed, but some electrical condition in the disturbed air to the westward seemed to prevent communication. Throughout the day, we all listened anxiously and tried to get Lake at intervals, but invariably without results. About noon, a positive frenzy of wind stampeded out of the west, causing us to fear for the safety of our camp. But it eventually died down with only a moderate relapse at 2 p.m. After three o'clock, it was very quiet, and we redoubled our efforts to get Lake. Nevertheless, the stony silence continued. And when we thought of the delirious force the wind must have had in his locality, we could not help making the more direful conjectures. The Mountains of Madness was written by H.P. Lovecraft and read by Richard Coyle. It was abridged by Paul Kent and the music was composed by John Nichols. The series is produced by Neil Gardner and is a Ladbrook Radio production for BBC Radio 7. At the Mountains of Madness continues to work. At the Mountains of Madness by H.P. Lovecraft Read by Richard Coyle Part 2 The Flight Our fears for Lake and his party had become intense and definite. And after a wireless consultation with the sea captains Douglas and Thorfinson, I resolved to take steps toward investigation. The fifth aeroplane, which we had left at the McMurdo Sound supply cache with Sherman and two sailors, was in good shape and ready for instant use. And it seemed that the very emergency for which it had been saved was now upon us. I got Sherman by wireless 
and ordered him to join me with the plane and the two sailors at the southern base as quickly as possible, the air conditions being apparently highly favorable. At 7.15 a.m., January 25th, we started flying northwestward under McTie's pilotage with ten men, seven dogs, a sledge, a fuel and food supply, and other items including the plane's wireless outfit. The sailor Larsen was first to spy the jagged line of witch-like cones and pinnacles ahead, and his shouts sent everyone to the windows of the great cabined plane. Despite our speed, they were very slow in gaining prominence. Hence we knew that they must be infinitely far off, and visible only because of their abnormal height. I could not help feeling that they were evil things, mountains of madness whose farther slopes looked out over some accursed ultimate abyss. We were over the lowest foothills now, and could see amid the snow, ice and bare patches of their main plateau, a couple of darkish spots which we took to be lakes camp and boring. The higher foothills shot up between five and six miles away, forming a range almost distinct from the terrifying line of more than Himalayan peaks beyond them. At length, Ropes, the student who had relieved McTie at the controls, began to head downward toward the left-hand dark spot whose size marked it as the camp. Some hours after our landing, we sent a guarded report of the tragedy we found and reluctantly announced the wiping out of the whole lake party by the frightful wind of the preceding day or of the night before that. Eleven known dead, young Gedney missing. People pardoned our hazy lack of details through realization of the shock the sad event must have caused us and believed us when we explained that the mangling action of the wind had rendered all eleven bodies unsuitable for transportation outside. We brought back all the books, scientific equipment and other incidentals we could find, though much was rather unaccountably blown away. Spare tents and furs were either missing or badly out of condition. It was approximately 4 p.m., after wide plane cruising had forced us to give Gedney up for lost, that we sent our guarded message to the Arkham for relaying. About the 14 biological specimens, we were pardonably indefinite. We said that the only ones we discovered were damaged, but that enough was left of them to prove Lake's description wholly and impressively accurate. It was hard work keeping our personal emotions out of this matter. And we did not mention numbers, or say exactly how we had found those which we did find. We had by that time agreed not to transmit anything suggesting madness on the part of Lake's men. And it surely looked like madness to find six imperfect monstrosities carefully buried upright in nine-foot snow graves under five-pointed mounds punched over with groups of dots in patterns exactly those on the queer greenish soapstones dug up from Mesozoic or tertiary times. The eight perfect specimens mentioned by Lake seem to have been completely blown away. We were careful too about the public's general peace of mind. Hence Danforth and I said little about that frightful trip over the mountains the next day. On our return at 1 a.m., Danforth was close to hysterics, but kept an admirably stiff upper lip. It took no persuasion to make him promise not to show our sketches and the other things we brought away in our pockets, not to say anything more to the others than what we had agreed to relay outside, and to hide our camera films for private development later on. So that part of my present story will be as new to Parbody, McTie, Ropes, Sherman and the rest as it will be to the world in general. Indeed, Danforth is closer mouthed than I, 
For he saw, or thinks he saw, one thing he will not tell even me. As the public knows, our return to the world was accomplished without further disasters. Since our return, we have all constantly worked to discourage Antarctic exploration. But now that Starkweather Moor party is organizing, and with a thoroughness far beyond anything our outfit attempted, if not dissuaded, they will get to the innermost nucleus of the Antarctic and melt and bore till they bring up that which we know may end the world. So I must break through all reticences at last. I hope I have said enough already to let me glide briefly over the rest. The rest, that is, of the horror at the camp. The crowning abnormality was the condition of the bodies, men and dogs alike. They had all been in some terrible kind of conflict and were torn and mangled in fiendish and altogether inexplicable ways. Some were incised and subtracted from in the most curious, cold-blooded and inhuman fashion. It was the same with dogs and men. All the healthier, fatter bodies, quadrupedal or bipedal, had had their most solid masses of tissue cut out and removed, as by a careful butcher, and around them was a strange sprinkling of salt, taken from the ravaged provision chests on the plains, which conjured up the most horrible associations. Gedney and one dog turned out to be missing in the end. But when we came on that terrible scene, we had missed two dogs and two men. But the fairly unharmed dissecting tent, which we entered after investigating the monstrous graves, had something to reveal. The scene was clearly not as Lake had left it, for the covered parts of the primal monstrosity had been removed from the improvised table. Indeed, we had already realized that one of the six imperfect and insanely buried things we had found must represent the collected sections of the entity which Lake had tried to analyze. On and around that laboratory table were strewn other things, and it did not take long for us to guess that those things were the carefully, though oddly and inexpertly dissected parts of one man and one dog. We buried the human parts beside the other ten men, and the canine parts with the other thirty-five dogs. This formed the worst of the camp horror. But other things were equally perplexing. The disappearance of Gedney, the one dog, the eight uninjured biological specimens, three sledges and certain instruments, illustrated technical and scientific books, writing materials, electric torches and batteries, food and fuel, heating apparatus, spare tents, fur suits and the like, was utterly beyond sane conjecture. In view of just such an eventuality as the present one, we carefully photographed all the main evidences of insane disorder at the camp and shall use the prints to buttress our pleas against the departure of the proposed Starkweather Moor expedition. Our first act after finding the bodies in the shelter was to photograph and open the row of insane graves with the five-pointed snow mounds. We could not help noticing the resemblance of these monstrous mounds with their clusters of grouped dots to poor Lake's descriptions of the strange greenish soapstones. And when we came on some of the soapstones themselves in the great mineral pile, we found the likeness very close indeed. In spite of all the prevailing horrors, we were left with enough sheer scientific zeal and adventurousness to wander about the unknown realm beyond those mysterious mountains. As our guarded messages stated, we rested at midnight after our day of terror and bafflement, 
but not without a tentative plan for one or more range crossing altitude flights in a lightened plane with aerial camera and geologist's outfit, beginning the following morning. It was decided that Danforth and I try it first, and we awaked at 7 a.m., intending an early flight. However, heavy winds, mentioned in our brief bulletin to the outside world, delayed our start till nearly nine o'clock. As we flew towards the forbidding peaks, dark and sinister above the line of crevasse-riven snow and interstitial glaciers, we noticed more and more the curiously regular formations clinging to the slopes. The ancient and wind-weathered rock strata proved that these pinnacles had been towering up in exactly the same way since a surprisingly early time in Earth's history, perhaps over 50 million years. How much higher they had once been, it was futile to guess. But everything about this strange region pointed to obscure atmospheric influences unfavorable to change and calculated to retard the usual climatic processes of rock disintegration. How to account for such things in this place was frankly beyond me, and I felt queerly humbled as a geologist. Igneous formations often have strange regularities, like the famous Giant's Causeway in Ireland, but this stupendous range, despite Lake's original suspicion of smoking cones, was above all else non-volcanic in evident structure. The curious cave mouths, near which the odd formations seemed most abundant, presented another, albeit a lesser puzzle, because of their regularity of outline. They were often approximately square or semicircular, as if the natural orifices had been shaped to greater symmetry by some magic hand. Their numerousness and wide distribution were remarkable and suggested that the whole region was honeycombed with tunnels dissolved out of limestone strata. Such glimpses as we secured did not extend far within the caverns, but we saw that they were apparently clear of stalactites and stalagmites. We were now, after a slow ascent, at a height of 23,570 feet, according to the aneroid, and had left the region of clinging snow definitely below us. Up here were only dark, bare rock slopes and the start of rough-ribbed glaciers. But with those provocative cubes, ramparts and echoing cave mouths to add a portent of the unnatural the fantastic and the dreamlike. Looking along the line of high peaks, I thought I could see the one mentioned by Poor Lake with a rampart exactly on top. It seemed to be half lost in a queer Antarctic haze, such a haze, perhaps, as had been responsible for Lake's early notion of volcanism. The pass loomed directly before us, smooth, and windswept between its jagged and malignly frowning pylons. Beyond it was a sky fretted with swirling vapors and lighted by the low polar sun, the sky of that mysterious farther realm upon which we felt no human eye had ever gazed. A few more feet of altitude, and we would behold that realm. Danforth and I Unable to speak except in shouts amidst the howling, piping wind that raced through the pass and added to the noise of the unmuffled engines, exchanged eloquent glances. And then, having gained those last few feet, we did indeed stare across the momentous divide and over the unsampled secrets of an elder and utterly alien Earth. I think that both of us simultaneously cried out in mixed awe, wonder, terror, and disbelief in our own senses as we finally cleared the pass and saw what lay beyond. Our eyes 
swept that limitless, tempest-scarred plateau and grasped the almost endless labyrinth of colossal, regular and geometrically eurythmic stone masses which reared their crumbled and pitted crests above a glacial sheet not more than 40 or 50 feet deep at its thickest, and in places obviously thinner. The effect of the monstrous sight was indescribable, for some fiendish violation of natural law seemed certain at the outset. Here, on a hellishly ancient tableland, fully 20,000 feet high, and in a climate deadly to habitation since a pre-human age not less than 500,000 years ago, there stretched, nearly to the vision's limit, a tangle of orderly stone which only the desperation of mental self-defense could possibly attribute to any but conscious and artificial cause. We had previously dismissed, so far as serious thought was concerned, any theory that the cubes and ramparts of the mountainsides were other than natural in origin. How could they be otherwise, when man himself could scarcely have been differentiated from the great apes at the time when this region succumbed to the present unbroken reign of glacial death? Only the incredible, unhuman massiveness of these vast stone towers and ramparts had saved the frightful things from utter annihilation in the hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of years, it had brooded there amidst the blasts of a bleak upland. Corona Mundi, roof of the world. All sorts of fantastic phrases sprang to our lips as we looked dizzily down at the unbelievable spectacle. I thought again of the eldritch primal myths that had so persistently haunted me since my first sight of this dead Antarctic world. Of the demoniac plateau of Leng. Of the Maigo, or abominable snowmen of the Himalayas. Of the narcotic manuscripts with their pre-human implications. Of the Cthulhu cult. Of the Necronomicon. And of the Hyperborean legends of formless Sothogua and the worse-than-formless star-spawn associated with that semi-entity. For boundless miles in every direction, the thing stretched off with very little thinning. Indeed, as our eyes followed it to the right and left along the base of the low, gradual foothills which separated it from the actual mountain rim, we decided that we could see no thinning at all, except for an interruption at the left of the pass through which we had come. We had merely struck, at random, a limited part of something of incalculable extent. The foothills were more sparsely sprinkled with grotesque stone structures, linking the terrible city to the already familiar cubes and ramparts which evidently formed its mountain outposts. These latter, as well as the queer cave mouths, were as thick on the inner as on the outer sides of the mountains. Looking back to our sensations, and recalling our dazedness at viewing this monstrous survival from eons we had thought pre-human, I can only wonder that we preserved the semblance of equilibrium which we did. Of course, we knew that something, chronology, scientific theory, or our own consciousness, was woefully awry. Yet we kept enough poise to guide the plane, observe many things quite minutely, and take a careful series of photographs, which may yet serve both us and the world in good stead. In my case, ingrained scientific habit may have helped, for above all my bewilderment and sense of menace, there burned a dominant curiosity to fathom more of this age-old secret, to know what sort of beings had built and lived in this incalculably gigantic place, and what relation to the general world of its time, or of other times so unique a concentration of life could have had. For this place, it could be no ordinary city. It must have formed the primary nucleus and center of some archaic and unbelievable chapter of Earth's history whose outward ramifications recalled only dimly in the most obscure and distorted myths, 
had vanished utterly amidst the chaos of terrene convulsions long before any human race we know had shambled out of apedom. Flying inland from the mountains, we discovered that the city was not of infinite width, even though its length along the foothills seemed endless. After about 30 miles, the grotesque stone buildings began to thin out, and in 10 more miles, we came to an unbroken waste virtually without signs of sentient artifice. So far we had made no landing, yet to leave the plateau without an attempt at entering some of the monstrous structures would have been inconceivable. Accordingly, we decided to find a smooth place on the foothills near our navigable pass, there grounding the plane and preparing to do some exploration on foot. Though these gradual slopes were partly covered with a scattering of ruins, low flying soon disclosed an ampler number of possible landing places. Selecting that nearest to the pass, since our flight would be across the Great Range and back to camp, we succeeded about 12.30 p.m. in effecting a landing on a smooth, hard snowfield wholly devoid of obstacles and well adapted to a swift and favorable takeoff later on. Walking cautiously downhill, over the crusted snow toward the stupendous stone labyrinth that loomed against the opalescent west, we felt almost as keen a sense of imminent marvels as we had felt on approaching the unfathomed mountain pass four hours previously. Though the thinness of the air at this prodigious altitude made exertion somewhat more difficult than usual, both Danforth and I found ourselves bearing up very well and felt equal to almost any task which might fall to our lot. It took only a few steps to bring us to a shapeless ruin worn level with the snow, while 10 or 15 rods farther on, there was a huge, roofless rampart still complete in its gigantic five-pointed outline and rising to an irregular height of 10 or 11 feet. For this latter we headed and when at last we were actually able to touch its weathered cyclopean blocks, we felt that we had established an unprecedented and almost blasphemous link with forgotten eons normally closed to our species. This rampart, shaped like a star and perhaps 300 feet from point to point, was built of Jurassic sandstone blocks of irregular size, averaging 6 by 8 feet in surface. There was a row of arched loopholes, or windows, about four feet wide and five feet high, spaced quite symmetrically along the points of the star and at its inner angles, and with the bottoms about four feet from the glaciated surface. Looking through these, we could see that the masonry was fully five feet thick, that there were no partitions remaining within, and that there were traces of banded carvings or bas-reliefs on the interior walls. Facts we had indeed guessed before when flying low over this rampart and others like it. Our field glasses showed what the city must once have looked like, even though most of the roofs and tower tops had necessarily perished. As a whole, it had been a complex tangle of twisted lanes and alleys, all of them deep canyons, and some little better than tunnels because of the overhanging masonry or overarching bridges. Now, outspread below us, it loomed like a dream fantasy against a westward mist through whose northern end the low, reddish Antarctic sun of early afternoon was struggling to shine. And when for a moment that sun encountered a denser obstruction and plunged the scene into temporary shadow, the effect was subtly menacing in a way I can never hope to depict. Even the faint howling and piping of the unfelt wind in the great mountain passes behind us took on a wilder note of purposeful malignity. The last stage of our descent to the town was unusually steep and abrupt, and a rock outcropping at the edge where the grade changed led us to think that an artificial terrace had once existed there. Under the glaciation, we believed, there must be a flight of steps or its equivalent. 
When at last we plunged into the town itself, clambering over fallen masonry and shrinking from the oppressive nearness and dwarfing height of omnipresent crumbling and pitted walls, our sensations again became such that I marvel at the amount of self-control we retained. Danforth was frankly jumpy and began making some offensively irrelevant speculations about the horror at the camp which I resented all the more because I could not help sharing certain conclusions forced upon us by many features of this morbid survival from nightmare antiquity. The speculations worked on his imagination too, for in one place, where a debris-littered alley turned a sharp corner, he insisted that he saw faint traces of ground markings which he did not like. Whilst elsewhere, he stopped to listen to a subtle, imaginary sound from some undefined point. A muffled, musical piping, he said, not unlike that of the wind in the mountain caves, yet somehow disturbingly different. The ceaseless, five-pointedness of the surrounding architecture, and of the few, distinguishable mural arabesques, had a dimly sinister suggestiveness we could not escape, and gave us a touch of terrible subconscious certainty concerning the primal entities which had reared and dwelt in this unhallowed place. The Mountains of Madness was written by H.P. Lovecraft and read by Richard Coyle. It was abridged by Paul Kent and the music was composed by John Nichols. The series is produced by Neil Gardner and is a Ladbrook Radio production for BBC Radio 7. The Mountains of Madness by H.P. Lovecraft Read by Richard Coyle Part 3 The Great Old Ones It would be cumbrous to give a detailed, consecutive account of our wanderings inside that cavernous, eon-dead honeycomb of primal masonry. That monstrous lair of elder secrets, which now echoed for the first time, after uncounted epochs, to the tread of human feet. This is especially true because so much of the horrible drama and revelation came from a mere study of the omnipresent mural carvings. Our flashlight photographs of those carvings will do much toward proving the truth of what we are now disclosing, and it is lamentable that we had not a larger film supply with us. As it was, we made crude notebook sketches of certain salient features after all our films were used up. The things, once rearing and dwelling in this frightful masonry in the age of dinosaurs, were not indeed dinosaurs, but far worse. Mere dinosaurs were new and almost brainless objects. But the builders of the city were wise and old, and had left certain traces in rocks even then laid down well nigh a thousand million years. Rocks laid down before the true life of Earth had advanced beyond plastic groups of cells. Rocks laid down before the true life of Earth had existed at all. They were the makers and enslavers of that life, and above all doubt, the originals of the fiendish elder myths, which things like the Narcotic Manuscripts and the Necronomicon affrightedly hint about. They were the great old ones, 
that had filtered down from the stars when Earth was young. The beings whose substance an alien evolution had shaped, and whose powers were such as this planet had never bred. Myth or otherwise, the sculptures told of the coming of those star-headed things to the nascent, lifeless Earth out of cosmic space. Their coming, and the coming of many other alien entities, such as at certain times embark upon spatial pioneering. They seemed able to traverse the interstellar ether on their vast, membranous wings thus oddly confirming some curious hill folklore long ago told me by an antiquarian colleague. They had lived under the sea a good deal, building fantastic cities and fighting terrific battles with nameless adversaries by means of intricate devices employing unknown principles of energy. Their preternatural toughness of organization and simplicity of natural wants made them peculiarly able to live on a high plane without the more specialized fruits of artificial manufacture and even without garments, except for occasional protection against the elements. It was under the sea, at first for food and later for other purposes, that they first created Earth life, using available substances according to long-known methods. The more elaborate experiments came after the annihilation of various cosmic enemies. They had done the same thing on other planets, having manufactured not only necessary foods, but certain multicellular protoplasmic masses capable of molding their tissues into all sorts of temporary organs under hypnotic influence, and thereby forming ideal slaves to perform the heavy work of the community. These viscous masses were without doubt what Abdul Alhazred whispered about as the Shoggoths in his frightful Necronomicon, though even that mad Arab had not hinted that any existed on Earth except in the dreams of those who had chewed a certain alkaloidal herb. With the aid of the Shoggoths, whose expansions could be made to lift prodigious weights, the small, low cities under the sea grew to vast and imposing labyrinths of stone, not unlike those which later rose on land. Indeed, the highly adaptable old ones had lived much on land in other parts of the universe, and probably retained many traditions of land construction. Of the life of the old ones, both under the sea and after part of them migrated to land, volumes could be written. Those in shallow water had continued the fullest use of the eyes at the ends of their five main head tentacles, and had practiced the arts of sculpture and of writing in quite the usual way. The writing accomplished with a stylus on waterproof waxen surfaces. Those lower down in the ocean depths though they used a curious phosphorescent organism to furnish light, pieced out their vision with obscure special sensors operating through the prismatic cilia on their heads. Sensors which rendered all the old ones partly independent of light in emergencies. The beings moved in the sea partly by swimming using the lateral arms and partly by wriggling with the lower tier of tentacles containing the pseudo feet. Occasionally, they accomplished long swoops with the auxiliary use of two or more sets of their fan-like folding wings. On land, they locally used the pseudo-feet, but now and then flew to great heights or over long distances with their wings. The toughness of the things was almost incredible. Even the terrific pressure of the deepest sea bottoms appeared powerless to harm them. Very few seemed to die at all, except by violence, and their burial places were very limited. The fact that they covered their vertically inhumed dead with five-pointed inscribed mounds set up thoughts in Danforth and me, which made a fresh pause and recuperation necessary after the sculptures revealed it. 
The beings multiplied by means of spores, but owing to their prodigious toughness and longevity, and consequent lack of replacement needs, they did not encourage the large-scale development of new Prothalia, except when they had new regions to colonize. Though able, like vegetables, to derive nourishment from inorganic substances, they vastly preferred organic, and especially animal food. They ate uncooked marine life under the sea, but cooked their viands on land. They hunted game and raised meat herds, slaughtering with sharp weapons whose odd marks on certain fossil bones our expedition had noted. They resisted all ordinary temperatures marvelously, and in their natural state could live in water down to freezing. When the great chill of the Pleistocene drew on, however, nearly a million years ago, the land dwellers had to resort to special measures, including artificial heating, until at last the deadly cold appears to have driven them back into the sea. Government was evidently complex and probably socialistic, though no certainties in this regard could be deduced from the sculptures we saw. There was extensive commerce, both local and between different cities, certain small, flat counters, five-pointed and inscribed, serving as money. Probably the smaller of the various greenish soapstones found by our expedition were pieces of such currency. Though the culture was mainly urban, some agriculture and much stock raising existed. Mining and a limited amount of manufacturing were also practiced. Travel was very frequent, but permanent migration seemed relatively rare, except for the vast colonizing movements by which the race expanded. For personal locomotion, no external aid was used, since in land, air, and water movement alike, the old ones seemed to possess excessively vast capacities for speed. Loads, however, were drawn by beasts of burden, shoggoths under the sea, and a curious variety of primitive vertebrates in the later years of land existence. These vertebrates, as well as an infinity of other life forms, animal and vegetable, marine, terrestrial and aerial, were the products of unguided evolution acting on life cells made by the old ones, but escaping beyond their radius of attention. They had been suffered to develop unchecked because they had not come in conflict with the dominant beings. It interested us to see in some of the very last and most decadent sculptures a shambling, primitive mammal, used sometimes for food and sometimes as an amusing buffoon by the land dwellers, whose vaguely simian and human foreshadowings were unmistakable. The persistence with which the Old Ones survived various geologic changes and convulsions of the Earth's crust was little short of miraculous. Though few or none of their first cities seem to have remained beyond the Archean Age, there was no interruption in their civilization or in the transmission of their records. Their original place of advent to the planet was the Antarctic Ocean, and it is likely that they came not long after the matter forming the moon was wrenched from the neighboring South Pacific. Another race. A land race of beings shaped like octopi and probably corresponding to fabulous pre-human spawn of Cthulhu soon began filtering down from cosmic infinity and precipitated a monstrous war which for a time drove the old ones wholly back to the sea a colossal blow in view of the increasing land settlements later peace was made and the new lands were given to the cthulhu spawn whilst the old ones held the sea and the older lands new land cities were founded the greatest of them in the antarctic for this region of first arrival was sacred. From then on, as before, the Antarctic remained the center of the Old One's civilization, and all the cities built there by the Cthulhu spawn were blotted out. Then, 
Suddenly, the lands of the Pacific sank again, taking with them the frightful stone city of Relia and all the cosmic octopi, so that the Old Ones were again supreme on the planet, except for one shadowy fear about which they did not like to speak. At a rather later age, their cities dotted all the land and water areas of the globe. The steady trend down the ages was from water to land, a movement encouraged by the rise of new land masses, though the ocean was never wholly deserted. Another cause of the landward movement was the new difficulty in breeding and managing the shoggoths upon which successful sea life depended. With the march of time, as the sculptures sadly confessed, the art of creating new life from inorganic matter had been lost, so that the old ones had to depend on the moulding of forms already in existence. On land, the great reptiles proved highly tractable, but the shoggoths of the sea, reproducing by fission and acquiring a dangerous degree of accidental intelligence, presented for a time a formidable problem. They had always been controlled through the hypnotic suggestions of the old ones and had modeled their tough plasticity into various useful temporary limbs and organs. But now their self-modeling powers were sometimes exercised independently and in various imitative forms implanted by past suggestion. They had, it seems, developed a semi-stable brain whose separate and occasionally stubborn volition echoed the will of the old ones without always obeying it. Sculptured images of these shoggoths filled Danforth and me with horror and loathing. They were normally shapeless entities composed of a viscous jelly which looked like an agglutination of bubbles and each averaged about 15 feet in diameter when a sphere. They had, however, a constantly shifting shape and volume, throwing out temporary developments or forming apparent organs of sight, hearing and speech in imitation of their masters, either spontaneously or according to suggestion. They seem to have become peculiarly intractable toward the middle of the Permian Age, perhaps 150 million years ago, when a veritable war of resubjugation was waged upon them by the marine old ones. Pictures of this war and of the headless, slime-coated fashion in which the Shoggoths typically left their slain victims, held a marvelously fearsome quality, despite the intervening abyss of untold ages. The Old Ones had used curious weapons of molecular and atomic disturbances against the rebel entities, and in the end had achieved a complete victory. Thereafter, the sculptures showed a period in which Shoggoths were tamed and broken by armed old ones, as the wild horses of the American West were tamed by cowboys. Though during the rebellion, the Shoggoths had shown an ability to live out of water, this transition was not encouraged, since their usefulness on land would hardly have been commensurate with the trouble of their management. During the Jurassic Age, the Old Ones met fresh adversity in the form of a new invasion from outer space. This time by half-fungus, half-crustacean creatures. Creatures undoubtedly the same as those figuring in certain whispered hill legends of the North and remembered in the Himalayas as the Maigo or abominable snowmen. To fight these beings, the Old Ones attempted, for the first time since their terrene advent, to sally forth again into the planetary ether. But despite all traditional preparations, found it no longer possible to leave the Earth's atmosphere. Whatever the old secret of interstellar travel had been, it was now definitely lost to the race. In the end, the Maigo drove the Old Ones out of all the northern lands, though they were powerless to disturb those in the sea. Little by little, the slow retreat of the Elder Race to their original Antarctic habitat was beginning. All this, of course, assuming that the non-terrestrial linkages and the anomalies ascribed to the invading foes are not pure mythology. 
Conceivably, the Old Ones might have invented a cosmic framework to account for their occasional defeats, since historical interest and pride obviously formed their chief psychological element. It is significant that their annals failed to mention many advanced and potent races of beings whose mighty cultures and towering cities figure persistently in certain obscure legends. Destruction of cities through the upthrust of mountains, the centrifugal rending of continents, the seismic convulsions of land or sea bottom, and other natural causes was a matter of common record. And it was curious to observe how fewer and fewer replacements were made as the ages wore on. The vast, dead megalopolis that yawned around us seemed to be the last general center of the race. Built early in the Cretaceous Age, after a titanic earth buckling had obliterated a still vaster predecessor not far distant. It appeared that this general region was the most sacred spot of all, where reputedly the first old ones had settled on a primal sea bottom. In the new city, many of whose features we could recognize in the sculptures, but which stretched fully a hundred miles along the mountain range in each direction, beyond the farthest limits of our aerial survey. There were reputed to be preserved certain sacred stones forming part of the first sea-bottom city, which thrust up to light after long epochs in the course of the general crumbling of strata. It was only in one late-built house with later decadent carvings that we obtained any foreshadowing of the final calamity leading to the city's desertion. The ultimate blow to the Old Ones, of course, was the coming of the Great Cold, which once held most of the Earth in thrall, and which has never departed from the ill-fated poles. The Great Cold that, at the world's other extremity, put an end to the fabled lands of Lomar and Hyperborea, just when this tendency began in the Antarctic, it would be hard to say in terms of exact years. Nowadays, we set the beginning of the general glacial periods at a distance of about 500,000 years from the present. But at the poles, the terrible scourge must have commenced much earlier. All quantitative estimates are partly guesswork, but it is quite likely that the decadent sculptures, i.e. the most recent, were made considerably less than a million years ago, and that the actual desertion of the city was complete long before the conventional opening of the Pleistocene, 500,000 years ago, as reckoned in terms of the Earth's whole surface. Then we saw a series of cartouches depicting a constantly growing migration to the nearest refuges of greater warmth, some fleeing to cities under the sea off the faraway coast, and some clambering down through networks of limestone caverns in the hollow hills to the neighboring black abyss of subterranean waters. In the end, it seems to have been the neighboring abyss which received the greatest colonization. This was partly due, no doubt, to the traditional sacredness of this special region, but may have been more conclusively determined by the opportunities it gave for continuing the use of the great temples on the honeycombed mountains and for retaining the vast land city as a place of summer residence and base of communication with various mines. The linkage of old and new abodes was made more effective by means of several gradings and improvements along the connecting routes, including the chiseling of numerous direct tunnels from the ancient metropolis to the Black Abyss, sharply down-pointing tunnels whose mouths we carefully drew, according to our most thoughtful estimates, on the guide map we were compiling. It was obvious that at least two of these tunnels lay within a reasonable exploring distance of where we were both being on the mountainwood edge of the city, one less than a quarter of a mile toward the ancient river course, and the other perhaps twice that distance in the opposite direction. The abyss, it seems, had shelving shores of dry land at certain places, but the old ones built their new city under water, no doubt because of its greater certainty of uniform warmth. 
The depth of the hidden sea appears to have been very great, so that the Earth's internal heat could ensure its habitability for an indefinite period. The beings seem to have had no trouble in adapting themselves to part-time, and eventually, of course, whole-time, residents underwater, since they had never allowed their gill systems to atrophy. There were many sculptures which showed how they had always frequently visited their submarine kinsfolk elsewhere, and how they had habitually bathed on the deep bottom of their great river. The darkness of inner Earth could likewise have been no deterrent to a race accustomed to long Antarctic nights. Decadent, though their style undoubtedly was, these latest carvings had a truly epic quality, where they told of the building of the new city in the cavern sea. The old ones had gone about it scientifically, quarrying insoluble rocks from the heart of the honeycombed mountains and employing expert workers from the nearest submarine city to perform the construction according to the best methods. These workers brought with them all that was necessary to establish the new venture, shoggoth tissue from which to breed stone lifters and subsequent beasts of burden for the cavern city and other protoplasmic matter to mold into phosphorescent organisms for lighting purposes. At last, a mighty metropolis rose on the bottom of that Stygian sea. Its architecture, much like that of the city above, and its workmanship displaying relatively little decadence because of the precise mathematical element inherent in building operations. The newly bred Shoggoths grew to enormous size and singular intelligence and were represented as taking and executing orders with marvelous quickness. They seemed to converse with the old ones by mimicking their voices, a sort of musical piping over a wide range if poor Lake's dissection had indicated a right, and to work more from spoken commands than from hypnotic suggestions as in earlier times. They were, however, kept in admirable control. The decadent cartouches and dados telling this story were, as I have said, the latest we could find in our limited search. They left us with a picture of the old ones shuttling back and forth betwixt the land city in summer and the sea cavern city in winter, and sometimes trading with the sea bottom cities off the Antarctic coast. By this time, the ultimate doom of the land city must have been recognized for the sculptures showed many signs of the cold's malign encroachments. Vegetation was declining, and the terrible snows of the winter no longer melted completely, even in midsummer. The Saurian livestock were nearly all dead, and the mammals were standing it none too well. To keep on with the work of the upper world, it had become necessary to adapt some of the amorphous and curiously cold-resistant Shoggoths to land life a thing the old ones had formerly been reluctant to do. The great river was now lifeless, and the upper sea had lost most of its denizens except the seals and whales. All the birds had flown away, save only great, grotesque penguins. What had happened afterward, we could only guess. And what of the specimens found by poor Lake? How did they fit in? for their geologic setting proved them to have lived at what must have been a very early date in the land city's history. They were, according to their location, certainly not less than 30 million years old, and we reflected that in their day, the sea cavern city, and indeed the cavern itself, had had no existence. They would have remembered an older scene, with lush tertiary vegetation everywhere, a younger land city of flourishing arts around them, and a great river sweeping northward along the base of the mighty mountains toward a faraway tropic ocean. And yet, we could not help thinking about these specimens, especially about the eight perfect ones that were missing from Lake's hideously ravaged camp. There was something abnormal about that whole business, those frightful graves, the amount and nature of the missing material. 
Gedni. The unearthly toughness of those archaic monstrosities, and the queer, vital freaks the sculptures now showed the race to have. Danforth and I had seen a good deal in the last few hours, and were prepared to believe and keep silent about many appalling and incredible secrets of primal nature. The Mountains of Madness was written by H.P. Lovecraft and read by Richard Coyle. It was abridged by Paul Kent and the music was composed by John Nichols. The series is produced by Neil Gardner and is a Ladbrook Radio production for BBC Radio 7. At the Mountains of Madness by H.P. Lovecraft Read by Richard Coyle Part 4 Within the Mountains Danforth and I's study of the decadent sculptures brought about a change in our immediate objective. This, of course, had to do with the chiseled avenues leading to the black inner world, of whose existence we had not known before, but which we were now eager to find and traverse. From the evident scale of the carvings, we deduced that a steeply descending walk of about a mile through either of the neighboring tunnels would bring us to the brink of the dizzy, sunless cliffs about the great abyss, down whose sides paths, improved by the old ones, led to the rocky shore of the hidden and nighted ocean. To behold this fabulous gulf in stark reality was a lure which seemed impossible of resistance once we knew of the thing. Yet we realized we must begin the quest at once if we expected to include it in our present trip. We had wormed our way very close to the computed site of the tunnel's mouth, having crossed a second-story bridge to what seemed plainly the tip of a pointed wall, and descended to a ruinous corridor especially rich in decadently elaborate and apparently ritualistic sculptures of late workmanship, when, shortly before 8.30 p.m., Danforth's keen young nostrils gave us the first hint of something unusual. If we had had a dog with us, I suppose we would have been warned before. At first, we could not precisely say what was wrong with the formerly crystal pure air, but after a few seconds, our memories reacted only too definitely. Let me try to state the thing without flinching. There was an odor, and that odor was vaguely, subtly, and unmistakably akin to what had nauseated us upon opening the insane grave of the horror poor Lake had dissected. Danforth's eyes, as well as nose, proved better than mine, for it was likewise he who first noticed the queer aspect of the debris after we had passed many half-choked arches leading to chambers and corridors on the ground level. It did not look quite as it ought, after countless thousands of years of desertion. And when we cautiously turned on more light, we saw that a kind of swathe seemed to have been lately tracked through it. The irregular nature of the litter precluded any definite marks, but in the smoother places, there were suggestions of the dragging of heavy objects. Once, we thought there was a hint of parallel tracks, as if of runners, this was what made us pause again. It was during that pause that we caught, simultaneously this time, the other odor ahead. Paradoxically, it was both a less frightful and more frightful odor, 
less frightful intrinsically, but infinitely appalling in this place under the known circumstances. For the odor was the plain and familiar one of common petrol, everyday gasoline. Our motivation after that is something I will leave to psychologists. We knew now that some terrible extension of the camp horrors must have crawled into this nighted burial place of the eons, and hence could not doubt any longer the existence of nameless conditions, present or at least recent, just ahead. Yet in the end, we did let sheer burning curiosity, or anxiety, or auto-hypnotism, or vague thoughts of responsibility toward Gedney, or whatnot, drive us on. We had turned off all light as we stood still, and vaguely noticed that a trace of deeply filtered upper day kept the blackness from being absolute. Having automatically begun to move ahead, we guided ourselves by occasional flashes from our torch. The disturbed debris formed an impression we could not shake off, and the smell of gasoline grew stronger. More and more ruin met our eyes and hampered our feet, until very soon we saw that the forward way was about to cease. Our tunnel quest was a blind one, and we were not even going to be able to reach the basement out of which the abyssward aperture opened. The torch flashing over the grotesquely carved walls of the blocked corridor in which we stood, showed several doorways in various states of obstruction, and from one of them, the gasoline odor, quite submerging that other hint of odor, came with especial distinctness. As we looked more steadily, we saw that beyond a doubt there had been a slight and recent clearing away of debris from that particular opening. Whatever the lurking horror might be, we believed the direct avenue toward it was now plainly manifest. I do not think anyone will wonder that we waited an appreciable time before making any further motion. And yet, when we did venture inside that black arch, our first impression was one of anticlimax. For amidst the littered expanse of that sculptured crypt, a perfect cube with sides of about twenty feet. There remained no recent object of instantly discernible size, so that we looked instinctively, though in vain, for a farther doorway. In another moment, however, Danforth's sharp vision had descried a place where the floor debris had been disturbed, and we turned on both torches full strength. Though what we saw in that light was actually simple and trifling. I am nonetheless reluctant to tell of it because of what it implied. It was a rough leveling of the debris, upon which several small objects lay carelessly scattered, and at one corner of which a considerable amount of gasoline must have been spilled lately enough to leave a strong odor even at this extreme super plateau altitude. In other words, it could not be other than a sort of camp. A camp made by questing beings who, like us, had been turned back by the unexpectedly choked way to the abyss. Let me be plain. The scattered objects were, so far as substance was concerned, all from Lake's camp. There are those who will say Danforth and I were utterly mad not to flee for our lives after that. Perhaps we were mad, for have I not said those horrible peaks were mountains of madness? At any rate, the thing we did was to start back over the indicated course to the circular place, the course which our nameless predecessors must have traversed twice before us. The other neighboring gate to the abyss would lie beyond that. I need not speak of our journey for it was precisely the same in kind as that by which we had reached the cul-de-sac, except that it tended to adhere more closely to the ground level and even descend to basement corridors. Every now and then we could trace certain disturbing marks in the debris or litter underfoot, 
and after we had passed outside the radius of the gasoline scent, we were again faintly conscious, spasmodically, of that more hideous and more persistent scent. After the way had branched from our former course, we sometimes gave the rays of our single torch a furtive sweep along the walls, noting in almost every case the well-nigh omnipresent sculptures, which indeed seemed to have formed a main aesthetic outlet for the old ones. About 9.30 p.m., while traversing a long, vaulted corridor whose increasingly glaciated floor seemed somewhat below the ground level and whose roof grew lower as we advanced, we began to see strong daylight ahead and were able to turn off our torch. It appeared that we were coming to the vast circular place and that our distance from the upper air could not be very great. The corridor ended in an arch surprisingly low for these megalithic ruins but we could see much through it even before we emerged. Beyond, there stretched a prodigious round space, fully 200 feet in diameter, strewn with debris and containing many choked archways corresponding to the one we were about to cross. But the salient object of the place was the titanic stone ramp which, eluding the archways by a sharp turn outward into the open floor, wound spirally up the stupendous cylindrical wall like an inside counterpart of those once climbing outside the monstrous towers or ziggurats of antique Babylon. As we stepped out into the awesome half-daylight of this monstrous cylinder bottom, 50 million years old, and without doubt the most primally ancient structure ever to meet our eyes, we saw that the ramp traversed sides stretched dizzily up to a height of fully 60 feet. It took us only a moment to conclude that this was indeed the route by which those others had descended, and that this would be the logical route for our own ascent. The tower's mouth was no farther from the foothills and our waiting plain than was the great terraced building we had entered and any further subglacial exploration we might make on this trip would lie in this general region. Oddly, we were still thinking about possible later trips, even after all we had seen and guessed. Then, as we picked our way cautiously over the debris of the great floor, there came a sight which, for the time, excluded all other matters. It was the neatly huddled array of three sledges in that farther angle of the ramp's lower and outward projecting course which had hitherto been screened from our view. There they were, the three sledges missing from Lake's camp, shaken by a hard usage which must have included forcible dragging along great reaches of snowless masonry and debris, as well as much hand portage over utterly unnavigable places. They were carefully and intelligently packed and strapped, and contained things memorably familiar enough. The gasoline stove, fuel cans, instrument cases, provision tins, tarpaulins obviously bulging with books, and some bulging with less obvious contents. Everything derived from Lake's equipment. After what we had found in that other room, we were in a measure prepared for this encounter. The really great shock came when we stepped over and undid one tarpaulin whose outlines had peculiarly disquieted us. It seems that others, as well as Lake, had been interested in collecting typical specimens. For there were two here, both stiffly frozen, perfectly preserved, patched with adhesive plaster where some wounds around the neck had occurred, and wrapped with care to prevent further damage. They were the bodies of young Gedney, and the missing dog. Many people will probably judge us callous, as well as mad, for thinking about the Northwood Tunnel and the Abyss so soon after our somber discovery. And I am not prepared to say that we would have immediately revived such thoughts, but for a specific circumstance which broke in upon us and set up a whole new train of speculations. We had replaced the tarpaulin over poor Gedney, and were standing in a kind of mute bewilderment, 
when the sounds finally reached our consciousness. The first sounds we had heard since descending out of the open where the mountain wind whined faintly from its unearthly heights. Well known and mundane though they were, their presence in this remote world of death was more unexpected and unnerving than any grotesque or fabulous tones could possibly have been, since they gave a fresh upsetting to all our notions of cosmic harmony. Had it been some trace of that bizarre musical piping over a wide range which Lake's dissection report had led us to expect in those others, and which indeed our overwrought fancies had been reading into every wind howl we had heard since coming on the Camp Horror, it would have had a kind of hellish congruity with the eon-dead region around us. A voice from other epochs belongs in a graveyard of other epochs. As it was, however, the noise shattered all our profoundly seated adjustments, all our tacit acceptance of the inner Antarctic as a waste utterly and irrevocably void of every vestige of normal life. What we heard was not the fabulous note of any buried blasphemy of Elder Earth from whose supernal toughness an age-denied polar sun had evoked a monstrous response. Instead, it was a thing so mockingly normal and so unerringly familiarized by our sea days off Victoria Land and our camp days at McMurdo Sound that we shuddered to think of it here where such things ought not to be. To be brief, it was simply the raucous squawking of a penguin. The muffled sound floated from subglacial recesses nearly opposite to the corridor whence we had come, regions manifestly in the direction of that other tunnel to the vast abyss. The presence of a living water bird in such a direction, in a world whose surface was one of age-long and uniform lifelessness, could lead to only one conclusion. Hence our first thought was to verify the objective reality of the sound. It was indeed repeated, and seemed at times to come from more than one throat. Seeking its source, we entered an archway from which much debris had been cleared. As the glaciated floor gave place to a litter of detritus, we plainly discerned some curious dragging tracks, and once Danforth found a distinct print of a sort whose description would be only too superfluous. The course indicated by the penguin cries was precisely what our map and compass prescribed as an approach to the more northerly tunnel mouth, and we were glad to find that a bridgeless thoroughfare on the ground and basement levels seemed open. The tunnel, according to the chart, ought to start from the basement of a large pyramidal structure which we seemed vaguely to recall from our aerial survey as remarkably well preserved. Along our path, the single torch showed a customary profusion of carvings. But we did not pause to examine any of these. Suddenly, a bulky white shape loomed up ahead of us, and we flashed on the second torch. This white, waddling thing was fully six feet high. We were clutched for an instant by primitive dread. Then came a flash of anticlimax as the white shape sidled into a lateral archway to our left to join two others of its kind which had summoned it in raucous tones. For it was only a penguin, albeit of a huge, unknown species larger than the greatest of the known king penguins and monstrous in its combined albinism and virtual eyelessness. When we had followed the thing into the archway and turned both our torches on the indifferent and unheeding group of three, we saw that they were all eyeless albinos of the same unknown and gigantic species. Their size reminded us of some of the archaic penguins depicted in the Old One's sculptures, and it did not take us long to conclude that they were descended from the same stock undoubtedly surviving through a retreat to some warmer inner region whose perpetual blackness had destroyed their pigmentation and atrophied their eyes to mere useless slits. That their present habitat was the vast abyss we sought was not for a moment to be doubted, and this evidence of the gulf's continued warmth and habitability filled us with the most curious and subtly perturbing fancies. We wondered too 
What had caused these three birds to venture out of their usual domain? The state and silence of the great dead city made it clear that it had at no time been an habitual seasonal rookery, whilst the manifest indifference of the trio to our presence made it seem odd that any passing party of those others should have startled them. Was it possible that those others had taken some aggressive action or tried to increase their meat supply? We doubted whether that pungent odor which the dogs had hated could cause an equal antipathy in these penguins, since their ancestors had obviously lived on excellent terms with the old ones. An amicable relationship which must have survived in the abyss below as long as any of the old ones remained. Regretting, in a flare-up of the old spirit of pure science, that we could not photograph these anomalous creatures, we shortly left them to their squawking and pushed on toward the abyss whose openness was now so positively proved to us and whose exact direction occasional penguin tracks made clear. Not long afterward, a steep descent in a long, low, doorless, and peculiarly sculptureless corridor led us to believe that we were approaching the tunnel mouth at last. We had passed two more penguins and heard others immediately ahead. Then the corridor ended in a prodigious open space, which made us gasp involuntarily. A perfect, inverted hemisphere, obviously deep underground, fully a hundred feet in diameter and fifty feet high, with low archways opening around all parts of the circumference but one, and that one yawning cavernously with a black, arched aperture, which broke the symmetry of the vault to a height of nearly fifteen feet. It was the entrance to the Great Abyss. In this vast hemisphere, whose concave roof was impressively though decadently carved to a likeness of the primordial celestial dome, a few albino penguins waddled, aliens there, but indifferent and unseeing. The black tunnel yawned indefinitely off at a steep, descending grade its aperture adorned with grotesquely chiseled jams and lintel. From that cryptical mouth, we fancied a current of slightly warmer air, and perhaps even a suspicion of vapor proceeded, and we wondered what living entities, other than penguins, the limitless void below, and the contiguous honeycombings of the land and the Titan Mountains, might conceal. We wondered, too, whether the trace of mountaintop smoke at first suspected by poor lake, as well as the odd haze we had ourselves perceived around the rampart-crowned peak, might not be caused by the tortuous channeled rising of some such vapor from the unfathomed regions of Earth's core. Entering the tunnel, we saw that its outline was, at least at the start, about 15 feet each way, sides, floor, and arched roof composed of the usual megalithic masonry. After about a quarter of a mile, the temperature was rapidly ascending, and we were not surprised to come upon a careless heap of material shudderingly familiar to us. It was composed of furs and tent cloth taken from Lake's camp, and we did not pause to study the bizarre forms into which the fabrics had been slashed. Slightly beyond this point, we noticed a decided increase in the size and number of the side galleries, and concluded that the densely honeycombed region beneath the higher foothills must now have been reached. The nameless scent was now curiously mixed with another and scarcely less offensive odor, of what nature we could not guess, though we thought of decaying organisms and perhaps unknown subterranean fungi. Then came a startling expansion of the tunnel for which the carvings had not prepared us, a broadening and rising into a lofty, natural-looking elliptical cavern with a level floor some 75 feet long and 50 broad, and with many immense side passages leading away into cryptical darkness. Though this cavern was natural in appearance, an inspection with both torches suggested that it had been formed by the artificial destruction of several walls between adjacent honeycombings. The walls were rough, and the high vaulted roof was thick with stalactites, but the solid rock floor had been smoothed off and was free from all debris, 
detritus, or even dust to a positively abnormal extent. Except for the avenue through which we had come, this was true of the floors of all the great galleries opening off from it, and the singularity of the condition was such as to set us vainly puzzling. The curious new feta which had supplemented the nameless scent was excessively pungent here, so much so that it destroyed all trace of the other. Something about this whole place, with its polished and almost glistening floor, struck us as more vaguely baffling and horrible than any of the monstrous things we had previously encountered. The regularity of the passage immediately ahead, as well as the larger proportion of penguin droppings there, prevented all confusion as to the right course amidst this plethora of equally great cave mouths. Nevertheless, we resolved to retreat if any further complexity should develop, for dust tracks, of course, could no longer be expected. Upon resuming our direct progress, we cast a beam of torchlight over the tunnel walls and stopped short in amazement at the supremely radical change which had come over the carvings in this part of the passage. We realized, of course, the great decadence of the Old One's sculpture at the time of the tunneling, and had indeed noticed the inferior workmanship of the arabesques in the stretchers behind us. But now, in this deeper section beyond the cavern, there was a sudden difference wholly transcending explanation, a difference in basic nature as well as in mere quality, and involving so profound and calamitous a degradation of skill that nothing in the hitherto observed rate of decline could have led one to expect it. This new and degenerate work was coarse, bold, and wholly lacking in delicacy of detail. It was countersunk with exaggerated depth in bands following the same general line as the sparse cartouches of the earlier sections, but the height of the reliefs did not reach the level of the general surface. Danforth had the idea that it was a second carving, a sort of palimpsest formed after the obliteration of a previous design. In nature, it was wholly decorative and conventional and consisted of crude spirals and angles roughly following the quintile mathematical tradition of the old ones, yet seemingly more like a parody than a perpetuation of that tradition. We could not get it out of our minds that some subtly but profoundly alien element had been added to the aesthetic feeling behind the technique. An alien element, Danforth guessed, that was responsible for the laborious substitution. That others had recently noticed this belt of carving was hinted by the presence of a used flashlight battery on the floor in front of one of the most characteristic cartouches. We saw and heard fewer penguins but thought we caught a vague suspicion of an infinitely distant chorus of them somewhere deep within the earth. The new and inexplicable odor was abominably strong, and we could detect scarcely a sign of that other nameless scent. Puffs of visible vapor ahead bespoke increasing contrasts in temperature, and the relative nearness of the sunless sea cliffs of the great abyss. Then, quite unexpectedly, we saw four obstructions on the polished floor ahead. Obstructions which were quite definitely not penguins. The Mountains of Madness was written by H.P. Lovecraft and read by Richard Coyle. It was abridged by Paul Kent and the music was composed by John Nichols. The series is produced by Neil Gardner and is a Ladbrook Radio production for BBC Radio 7.
the Mountains of Madness by H.P. Lovecraft Read by Richard Coyle Part 5 The Final Nightmare Danforth and I approached the four sprawling and incomplete obstructions slowly and reluctantly. Would to heaven we had never approached them at all, but had run back at top speed out of that blasphemous tunnel with the greasily smooth floors and the degenerate murals aping and mocking the things they had superseded. Run back before we had seen what we did see, and before our minds were burned with something which will never let us breathe easily again. Both of our torches were turned on the prostrate objects, so that we soon realized the dominant factor in their incompleteness. Mauled, compressed, twisted and ruptured as they were, their chief common injury was total decapitation. From each one, the tentacled starfish head had been removed. And as we drew near, we saw that the manner of removal looked more like some hellish tearing or suction than like any ordinary form of cleavage. Their noisome, dark green ichor formed a large, spreading pool, but its stench was half overshadowed by the newer and stranger stench, here more pungent than at any other point along our route. Only when we had come very close to the sprawling obstructions could we trace that second, unexplainable fetter to any immediate source. And the instant we did so, Danforth, remembering certain very vivid sculptures of the Old One's history in the Permian Age 150 million years ago, gave vent to a nerve-tortured cry which echoed hysterically through that vaulted and archaic passage with the evil palimpsest carvings. I came only just short of echoing his cry myself, for I had seen those primal sculptures too, and had shudderingly admired the way the nameless artist had suggested that hideous slime coating found on certain incomplete and prostrate old ones, those whom the frightful Shoggoths had characteristically slain and sucked to a ghastly headlessness in the great war of resubjugation. And now... When Danforth and I saw the freshly glistening and reflective iridescent black slime which clung thickly to those headless bodies and stank obscenely with that new odor whose cause only a diseased fancy could envisage, clung to those bodies and sparkled less voluminously on a smooth part of the accursedly re-sculptured wall in a series of grouped dots, we understood the quality of cosmic fear to its uttermost depths. It was not fear of those four missing others, for all too well did we suspect they would do no harm again. Poor devils. After all, they were not evil things of their kind. They were the men of another age and another order of being. Nature had played a hellish jest on them, as it will on any others that human madness, callousness, or cruelty may hereafter dig up in that hideously dead or sleeping polar waste. And this was their tragic homecoming. They had not been even savages, for what indeed had they done? That awful awakening in the cold of an unknown epoch. Perhaps an attack by the furry, frantically barking quadrupeds and a dazed defense against them and the equally frantic white simians with the queer wrappings and paraphernalia. Poor Lake. Poor Gedney. And poor old ones. Scientists to the last. What had they done that we would not have done in their place? God, what intelligence and persistence. What a facing of the incredible. Just as those carven kinsmen and forebears had faced things only a little less incredible. Radiates, vegetables, monstrosities, star spawn, 
whatever they had been. They were men. They had crossed the icy peaks on whose templed slopes they had once worshipped and roamed among the tree ferns. They had found their dead city brooding under its curse and had read its carven latter days as we had done. They had tried to reach their living fellows in fabled depths of blackness they had never seen. And what had they found? All this flashed in unison through the thoughts of Danforth and me as we looked from those headless, slime-coated shapes to the loathsome palimpsest sculptures and the diabolical dot groups of fresh slime on the wall beside them, looked and understood what must have triumphed and survived down there in the Cyclopean water city of that nighted, penguin-fringed abyss, whence even now a sinister curling mist had begun to belch pallidly, as if in answer to Danforth's hysterical scream. The shock of recognizing that monstrous slime and headlessness had frozen us into mute, motionless statues. And it is only through later conversations that we have learned of the complete identity of our thoughts at that moment. It seemed eons that we stood there, but actually it could not have been more than 10 or 15 seconds. That hateful pallid mist curled forward as if veritably driven by some remoter advancing bulk. And then came a sound which upset much of what we had just decided. And in so doing, broke the spell and enabled us to run like mad past squawking, confused penguins over our former trail back to the city, along ice-sunken, megalithic corridors to the great open circle and up that archaic spiral ramp in a frenzied, automatic plunge for the sane outer air and light of day. The new sound had a shocking resemblance to the wind pipings we had both heard around the lofty mountain caves. At the risk of seeming puerile, I will add another thing too, if only because of the surprising way Danforth's impressions chimed with mine. Of course, common reading is what prepared us both to make the interpretation, though Danforth has hinted at queer notions about unsuspected and forbidden sources to which Edgar Allan Poe may have had access when writing the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket a century ago. It will be remembered that in that fantastic tale, there is a word of unknown but terrible and prodigious significance connected with the Antarctic and screamed eternally by the gigantic, spectrally snowy birds of that malign region's core. Tequili Lee, Tequili Lee. That, I may admit, is exactly what we thought we heard conveyed by that sudden sound behind the advancing white mist. That insidious, musical piping over a singularly wide range. We were in full flight before three notes or syllables had been uttered. Though we knew that the swiftness of the old ones would enable any scream-roused and pursuing survivor of the slaughter to overtake us in a moment if it really wished to do so. Concealment being futile at this juncture, we used our torch for a running glance behind and perceived that the mist was thinning. Would we see at last a complete and living specimen of those others? Again came that insidious musical piping, Tequili Lee, Tequili Lee. Thank heaven we did not slacken our run. The curling mist had thickened again and was driving ahead with increased speed, whilst the straying penguins in our rear were squawking and screaming and displaying signs of a panic really surprising in view of their relatively minor confusion when we had passed them. Our recklessly used torch now revealed ahead of us the large open cavern where various ways converged, and we were glad to be leaving those morbid palimpsest sculptures almost felt, even when scarcely seen, behind. Another thought which the advent of the cave inspired was the possibility of losing our pursuer at this bewildering focus of large galleries. The fact that we survived and emerged 
is sufficient proof that the thing did take a wrong gallery, whilst we providentially hit on the right one. The penguins alone could not have saved us, but in conjunction with the mist, they seem to have done so. Only a benign fate kept the curling vapors thick enough at the right moment, for they were constantly shifting and threatening to vanish. Indeed, they did lift for a second, just before we emerged from the nauseously re-sculptured tunnel into the cave, so that we actually caught one first and only half glimpse of the oncoming entity as we cast a final, desperately fearful glance backward, before dimming the torch and mixing with the penguins in the hope of dodging pursuit. If the fate which screened us was benign, that which gave us the half glimpse was infinitely the opposite. For to that flash of semi-vision can be traced a full half of the horror which has ever since haunted us. So we glanced back simultaneously, it would appear, though no doubt the incipient motion of one prompted the imitation of the other. As we did so, we flashed both torches full strength at the momentarily thinned mist. Either from sheer primitive anxiety to see all we could, or in a less primitive but equally unconscious effort to dazzle the entity before we dimmed our light and dodged among the penguins of the labyrinth center ahead. Unhappy act. Not Orpheus himself or Lot's wife paid much more dearly for a backward glance. And again came that shocking, wide-ranged piping, Tequili Lee, Tequili Lee. It crippled our consciousness so completely that I wonder we had the residual sense to dim our torches as planned and to strike the right tunnel toward the dead city. Instinct alone must have carried us through. Perhaps better than reason could have done, though if that was what saved us, we paid a high price. Of reason, we certainly had little enough left. Danforth was totally unstrung, and the first thing I remember of the rest of the journey was hearing him lightheadedly chant an hysterical formula in which I alone of mankind could have found anything but insane irrelevance. It reverberated in falsetto echoes among the squawks of the penguins, reverberated through the vaultings ahead, and thank God, through the now empty vaultings behind. He could not have begun it at once, else we would not have been alive and blindly racing. I shudder to think of what a shade of difference in his nervous reactions might have brought. South Station Under, Washington Under, Park Street Under, Kendall Central, Harvard. The poor fellow was chanting the familiar stations of the Boston-Cambridge tunnel that burrowed through our peaceful native soil thousands of miles away in New England. Yet to me, the ritual had neither irrelevance nor home feeling. It had only horror, because I knew unerringly the monstrous, nefandous analogy that had suggested it. We had expected, upon looking back, to see a terrible and incredible moving entity if the mists were thin enough. But of that entity, we had formed a clear idea. What we did see, for the mists were indeed all too malignly thinned, was something altogether different and immeasurably more hideous and detestable. It was the utter, objective embodiment of the fantastic novelist's thing that should not be. And its nearest, comprehensible analogue is a vast, onrushing subway train as one sees it from a station platform, the great black front looming colossally out of infinite subterranean distance, constellated with strangely colored lights and filling the prodigious burrow as a piston fills a cylinder. But we were not on a station platform. We were on the track ahead as the nightmare plastic column of fetid black iridescence oozed tightly onward through its 15-foot sinus, gathering unholy speed and driving before it a spiral, re-thickening cloud of the pallid abyss vapor. It was a terrible, indescribable thing vaster than any subway train. A shapeless congeries of protoplasmic bubbles, faintly self-luminous, 
and with myriads of temporary eyes forming and unforming as postules of greenish light all over the tunnel-filling front that bore down upon us, crushing the frantic penguins and slithering over the glistening floor that it and its kind had swept so evilly free of all litter. Still came that eldritch, mocking cry, Tequili Lee, Tequili Lee. And at last we remembered that the demoniac shoggoths, given life, thought, and plastic organ patterns solely by the old ones, and having no language save that which the dot groups expressed, had likewise no voice save the imitated accents of their bygone masters. Danforth and I have recollections of emerging into the great sculptured hemisphere, and of threading our back trail through the cyclopean rooms and corridors of the dead city. Yet these are purely dream fragments involving no memory of volition, details, or physical exertion. It was as if we floated in a nebulous world or dimension without time, causation, or orientation. The grey, half-daylight of the vast circular space sobered us somewhat, but we did not go near those cached sledges or look again at poor Gedney and the dog. They have a strange and titanic mausoleum, and I hope the end of this planet will find them still undisturbed. Finally scrambling out at the top, we found ourselves on a great mound of tumbled blocks, with the curved walls of higher stonework rising westward, and the brooding peaks of the great mountains showing beyond the more crumbled structures toward the east. The low, Antarctic sun of midnight peered redly from the southern horizon through rifts in the jagged ruins, and the terrible age and deadness of the nightmare city seemed all the starker by contrast with such relatively known and accustomed things as the features of the polar landscape. The sky above was a churning and opalescent mass of tenuous ice vapors, and the cold clutched at our vitals. Wearily resting the outfit bags to which we had instinctively clung throughout our desperate flight, we rebuttoned our heavy garments for the stumbling climb down the mound and the walk through the eon-old stone maze to the foothills where our aeroplane waited. Of what had set us fleeing from that darkness of Earth's secret and archaic gulfs, we said nothing at all. There now lay revealed on the ultimate wide horizon behind the grotesque city, a dim, elfin line of pinnacled violet whose needle-pointed heights loomed dreamlike against the beckoning rose color of the western sky. Up toward the shimmering rim sloped the ancient tableland, the depressed course of the bygone river traversing it as an irregular ribbon of shadow. For a second, we gasped in admiration of the scene's unearthly cosmic beauty. And then, vague horror began to creep into our souls. For this far violet line could be nothing else than the terrible mountains of the Forbidden Land, highest of Earth's peaks and focus of Earth's evil, harborers of nameless horrors and Archean secrets, shunned and prayed to by those who feared to carve their meaning, untrodden by any living thing on Earth, but visited by the sinister lightnings and sending strange beams across the plains in the polar night. Beyond doubt, the unknown archetype of that dreaded Kadath in the cold waste beyond abhorrent Leng, whereof primal legends hint evasively. If the sculptured maps and pictures in that pre-human city had told truly, these cryptic, violet mountains could not be much less than 300 miles away. Yet nonetheless sharply did their dim, elfin essence appear above that remote and snowy rim, like the serrated edge of a monstrous alien planet about to rise into unaccustomed heavens. Their height, then, must have been tremendous beyond all comparison carrying them up into tenuous atmospheric strata peopled only by such gaseous wraiths as rash flyers have barely lived to whisper of after unexplainable falls. 
Looking at them, I thought nervously of certain sculptured hints of what the great bygone river had washed down into the city from their accursed slopes, and wondered how much sense and how much folly had lain in the fears of those old ones who carved them so reticently. Yet long before we had passed the great star-shaped ruin and reached our plain, our fears had become transferred to the lesser but vast enough range whose recrossing lay ahead of us. From these foothills, the black, ruin-crusted slopes reared up starkly and hideously against the east. And when we thought of the frightful amorphous entities that might have pushed their fetidly squirming way even to the topmost hollow pinnacles, we could not face without panic the prospect of again sailing by those suggestive skyward cave mouths where the wind made sounds like an evil musical piping over a wide range. To make matters worse, we saw distinct traces of local mist around several of the summits, as poor Lake must have done when he made that early mistake about volcanism, and thought shiveringly of that kindred mist from which we had just escaped, of that, and of the blasphemous, horror-fostering abyss whence all such vapors came. All was well with the plane, and we clumsily hauled on our heavy flying furs. Danforth got the engine started without trouble, and we made a very smooth takeoff over the nightmare city. As we drew close to the jutting peaks, the wind's strange piping again became manifest, and I could see Danforth's hands trembling at the controls. Rank amateur that I was, I thought at that moment that I might be a better navigator than he in affecting the dangerous crossing between pinnacles. And when I made motions to change seats and take over his duties, he did not protest. I tried to keep all my skill and self-possession about me and stared at the sector of reddish farther sky betwixt the walls of the pass resolutely refusing to pay attention to the puffs of mountaintop vapor, and wishing that I had wax-stopped ears like Ulysses's men off the Siren's coast to keep that disturbing windpiping from my consciousness. But Danforth, released from his piloting and keyed up to a dangerous, nervous pitch, could not keep quiet. I felt him turning and wriggling about as he looked back at the terrible, receding city. Ahead, at the cave-riddled, cube-barnacled peaks. Sidewise, at the bleak sea of snowy, rampart-strewn foothills. And upward, at the seething, grotesquely clouded sky. It was then, just as I was trying to steer safely through the pass, that his mad shrieking brought us so close to disaster by shattering my tight hold on myself and causing me to fumble helplessly with the controls for a moment. A second afterward, my resolution triumphed and we made the crossing safely. Yet I am afraid that Danforth will never be the same again. I have said that Danforth refused to tell me what final horror made him scream out so insanely. A horror which, I feel sadly sure, is mainly responsible for his present breakdown. We had snatches of shouted conversation above the winds piping and the engines buzzing as we reached the safe side of the range and swooped slowly down toward the camp. But that had mostly to do with the pledges of secrecy we had made as we prepared to leave the Nightmare City. Certain things we agreed were not for people to know and discuss lightly. And I would not speak of them now but for the need of heading off that Stark Weather Moor expedition and others at any cost. It is absolutely necessary for the peace and safety of mankind that some of Earth's dark, dead corners and unplumbed depths be let alone, lest sleeping abnormalities wake to resurgent life and blasphemously surviving nightmares squirm and splash out of their black lairs to newer and wider conquests. All that Danforth has ever hinted 
is that the final horror was a mirage. It was not, he declares, anything connected with the cubes and caves of those echoing, vaporous, wormily honeycombed mountains of madness which we crossed, but a single fantastic, demoniac glimpse among the churning zenith clouds of what lay back of those other violent westward mountains which the old ones had shunned and feared. It is very probable that the thing was a sheer delusion born of the previous stresses we had passed through, and of the actual, though unrecognized, mirage of the dead transmontane city experienced near Lake's camp the day before. But it was so real to Danforth that he suffers from it still. He has, on rare occasions, whispered disjointed and irresponsible things about the Black Pit, the Carven Rim, the Proto-Shoggoths, the windowless solids with five dimensions, the nameless cylinder, the Elder Pharos, yog sothoth the primal white jelly, the color out of space, the wings, the eyes in darkness, the moon ladder, the original, the eternal, the undying, and other bizarre conceptions. But when he is fully himself, he repudiates all this and attributes it to his curious and macabre reading of earlier years. Danforth, indeed, is known to be among the few who have ever dared go completely through that worm-riddled copy of the Necronomicon kept under lock and key in the college library. The higher sky, as we crossed the range, was surely vaporous and disturbed enough. And although I did not see the zenith, I can well imagine that its swirls of ice dust may have taken strange forms. Imagination, knowing how vividly distant scenes can sometimes be reflected, refracted and magnified by such layers of restless cloud, might easily have supplied the rest. And of course, Danforth did not hint any of these specific horrors till after his memory had had a chance to draw on his bygone reading. He could never have seen so much in one instantaneous glance. At the time, his shrieks were confined to the repetition of a single mad word of all too obvious source. Tequili Lee. Tequili Lee. The Mountains of Madness was written by H.P. Lovecraft and read by Richard Coyle. It was abridged by Paul Kent and the music was composed by John Nichols. The series was produced by Neil Gardner and was a Ladbrook Radio production for BBC Radio 7. <laughs>